Okay, well, welcome everyone to the second part of uh, Bioimage Analysis with Jupyter and Python seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce Guillaume Witz, um, who will lead you through the seminar, uh, and also um, Cedric Monesh and Mikhailo Vladimirov, his colleagues from Berm. And we also today have Anna Klemm from Uppsala. So a lot of Bioimage Analyst experts helping. Um, and with this, you. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Welcome to this second uh, session. Um, I called it season one, episode two. Hopefully there are going to be other seasons of these courses. I think they are great. Um, uh, yeah, so you, you have been introduced again to the, to the uh, moderators. So feel free to uh, ask uh, some new questions. As has been said, uh, the previous questions um, uh, have been posted already um, on the ImageSC forum. You can find uh, the link uh, here. Uh, I have edited them uh, slightly, completed in cases, and uh, I grouped them by, by topics. So you can maybe find, uh, if you ask the question, you can maybe find your question uh, in there uh, somewhere. And the new ones are going to be posted in the same thread on the ImageSC uh, forum. Uh, again, the course material is available uh, on this GitHub repository. Probably you uh, know it if you went through the, the content. And this presentation is uh, available at the same link as last time. I completed the presentation with some new slides. Um, so you will find uh, the new slides also, also there. Um, Uh, before I start, let me just briefly uh, remind you that there are, uh, if you're still interested in Python and more advanced Python, there are uh, really interesting sessions coming up uh, in May by, uh, there are two sessions by people from uh, the cell profiler team, one about really much more advanced uh, Python uh, topics uh, very soon, tomorrow, yes, 14th of May. Um, and there is, will be one about writing modules in cell profiler and cell Profiler is based largely on scikit image. So I hope this course will be uh, helpful if you want to follow that, that, uh, that course. And uh, in June, there's going to be a session about Napari. I mentioned Napari. Uh, if you installed um, um, uh, this, uh, the, the course material on your own computer, you will have, you, you maybe explored already Napari. Um, so there will be a specific uh, session uh, on, this, uh, on this software. So I won't, uh, cover this too much today. Maybe I will show an example uh, and I won't answer too many questions since you will have the chance um, to have uh, explanations by uh, one of the core developers, uh, Nicolas Sofroniev. And notice just that the, the time is one hour later, uh, I guess, because he's uh, in San Francisco. And so just don't uh, uh, get mixed up. Okay, uh, so what is today's uh, program? So as I said, the, the program last time, the program would depend a bit on the feedback that we had last time and on the questions that were asked. And so I tried to put uh, together something that, uh, that would satisfy uh, everyone. So I assume most people said they would try to go through some material at least. Um, so I didn't want to just go through one of those pre-made notebooks. You can go through them. There, there are lots of explanations. Um, and so, it, so to avoid that it's uh, too boring, um, I, I will do sort of live uh, coding session where I will uh, show a very simple um, an, uh, analysis pipeline and that would il illustrate uh, several important topics or things I think are, are important. And that will also allow me to answer uh, questions that have been asked last time and also during last week uh, on, the, on the Google form. So it will be just an illustration. I think it's also good for you to see how these things are done live and not just with pre-made things that are already working. Um, because in case I make a small mistake, you will see how to correct it, how to understand what the mistake was. Um, so that will be slightly different. Then there will be, a, be uh, I will say a few words about mixing languages in Jupyter, um, uh, in particular with R and also with ImageJ. So there were lots of questions last time about, about this PyImageJ. So I will show you a really advanced example of how you can use PyImageJ and Clij this GPU um, um, computing uh, package that has been originally designed for, for Fiji, that it can run also in Python. 
And so I made a, a notebook that runs on Colab, and on Colab you can use GPUs. So I will illustrate how this how this works. Um, then I would just briefly mention some additional um, information about uh, Jupyter and some options you have, like another uh, interface and extensions. And then there will be a last large chunk of the, the course that will be dedicated to installations. So there were, there were lots of questions about the uh, installations. Um, I kind of rebrushed over the topic and um, I realized that if people really want to use uh, the, the material and then write their own code for their own work, they will install this on their machine. And so it was a bit unfair to just uh, leave it uh, a bit in the air how to do an installation. So I will show really step by step uh, how to do an installation using Conda uh, because I think it's um, a it's my preferred solution. It's a great, really a great solution to do that. Uh, and so I will explain what an environment is because last time I just mentioned environments without really saying what they are. So we really go step by step through all this uh, this information. Um, Okay, so uh, I think I will just now for the moment uh, get out of this and um, open a Jupyter session. So I have already Jupyter session open. It's open on my own uh, computer, as you see. It's uh, the address is my local host, but it will run in the same way in um, on Binder, for example. So it's always always the same story. Um, and I will um, just create a new notebook so that you can really see how it works fresh. So it's the same environment as uh, we used before. Um, I will try to make it a bit bigger so that you can read uh, what it is that I write. So the first thing I just really briefly wanted to mention because it's, it's questions came up on this topic and uh, in my interactions with people, I also see these interactions, these questions coming uh, up uh, very often. It's about how you use NumPy and what are the dimensions of, the, of a NumPy array. So for this, I will use uh, this library uh, to import that I mentioned last time. Um, and I will say uh, from AE. And notice that when you import packages, uh, this is one feature of, uh, of Jupyter. When you start a few letters, you can uh, type uh, on, on, on tab and this will suggest you uh, packages, okay? So you don't have to type everything um, uh, every time. So now I want this package and I will want to import just a part of it. For, so I will import and here again, you can type tab and it will offer you the different modules that are present uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this package. Okay, so this is really uh, useful. So just use tab um, to do that. So I import this, this was also illustrated uh, in, in several notebooks. Uh, I'm importing uh, matplotlib also, just to show uh, the images. Uh, and I will import NumPy, because you always need NumPy. Uh, ah, and you see here, you see that you have the debugger here. I forgot to say as. So there are multiple ways of importing these, these packages, uh, right? There were also questions about this, I will see, I will mention this a bit later. And now I import my image um, like before. So this notebook is present two, le two levels below uh, my data folder. So I'm in, here in this supplementary folder and the data that are present in this main BiAPI uh, folder, okay? So now I'm going two level down uh, some people also struggled a bit with this. So uh, this and this. So now to be, to come back to the level of where my data are really where I have to go two steps up. And to do that, you type two dots, slash two dots, second level. And now I'm on the level where I have data. And here again, you can use a tab. So you can use auto completion. Uh, Jupyter knows that you're looking for a pass. And so it will suggest something. So there is only one folder starting with data. If I do that again, these are all the files that are present in that folder. Okay, so you, again, you don't have to type everything. So I need the first one, you can even click on it. And this is also auto-completed. So again, tab, 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 tab. Okay, so now I, I load that image. Uh, I can get the shape of that image. You see that these are the dimensions. And so there, there are uh, X and Y, and there are five Z stacks, uh, two colors, two channels, and 72 time points. 
Okay, so now I was had the possibility to import it like this. So I can say get again. You can use tab. It will suggest you the possible functions that you have uh, assigned to this uh, to this object. And so I want to get image data. Here has to say in what order I want the dimensions. Okay, so this is designed in this AICS package. And so I can just say, okay, I want Z first and then X and Y. And then I want this for the T is equal to zero. So time zero, and then this is how I want my output. Okay, if I do this, uh, I have two colors. So I would just say, see, you have again an error message and it tells me in detail what is wrong or what is missing. Okay, and now I can ask what, so this is NumPy array. And I can ask what is the shape, okay? So if I just show the output, it's just a big uh, matrix of number. It's a three dimensional matrix. And you see that the Z dimension is indeed in the first place, okay? And now if I want to do a projection, I can just say use imshow. Then I take my image and I use the max uh, method. And I say along which axis I want to project. So I want to do a Z projection. My Z axis is in, the, is in the first dimension. So I will say axis is equal to zero because, because we start counting from zero, okay? So this gives me a projection of, these, uh, of this Z stack, okay? But now um, I could also import it with the Z axis uh, as last element, okay? If I do that, I end up with an array where X and Y in the, are in the first dimension and Z is, is in the third dimension. So now, I, if I want to do a Z projection, I have to project along the third dimension, which is axis two, okay? Same image. So it didn't change anything at all. So I just uh, showed this example as an illustration uh, of the fact um, that the dimensions in, in NumPy uh, are not uh, defined uh, by names. So you don't know if the first axis is X or Y or Z. Uh, if you create an array like I did in some exercises, I said NP uh, zeros, then 10, four, and I said, okay, this is an image with uh, uh, 10 pixels wide, 10 pixels high, and with four planes, I could have defined it uh, like this in the same way, okay? Um, it's up to you to know what your dimensions are. Or if you have the chance that your images are formatted properly, and when you import them, the, the your importer know, knows what the dimensions are. Okay, so if I, um, the, 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 there was a command uh, to do this that I forgot now. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this tells you exactly in what order this image, the dimensions are uh, originally stored. And so uh, this reader knows how they organized. Otherwise it's really up to you when you import your image to know what dimensions is in which axis. Okay, if X and Y are in the first dimensions or Z first or last, etc. So a NumPy array has no metadata. Okay, so this is just the, the first point I, I wanted to, to specify. Okay, so now we're going to look at another data set. Um, I will just uh, close this because I won't need it anymore. And I will create a, an, an, another notebook. Um, And the goal will be to use this data set. So this is a data set from uh, the broad bioimage benchmark collection, which is a really uh, absolutely great uh, resource that somehow uh, is uh, from the same people as, uh, as Cell Profiler. And so you find a lot of data sets in there to test things. Um, so they're real data sets and uh, they, they have some information sometimes even, even about segmentation. So if you have a, seg if you developed your own segmentation, you can co uh, compare it to what is available on here. And so there are several data sets. I'm going to just look at this data set here. Um, the, the data are acquired, it's a, it's a fluorescence microscopy and you have uh, the cytoplasm and nuclei. 
and, and so two channels and you have um, one channel is actually not really the, the, the cytoplasm. It appears here as cytoplasm in, in green. It's actually a protein that can be either in the cytoplasm or in the, in the nucleus. And so the cells were treated. So there are, there are uh, control, uh, controls and treated cells. And in the treated cells, the, the signal goes into the nucleus. Um, okay, so, so the goal will be to be able to know um, if the treatment had an effect and what effect it had. So the data is from the 96 well plate. So we're going, going to get uh, a lot of data um, and a plate like this. So for now, we forget about the fact that we know uh, what the treatment was done. Of course, it's described here. We just know that we have for each line a given uh, a, um, uh, a given. So you have in blue and in yellow, you have different types of treatments, and you have uh, and you have uh, uh, replicas. So you can download this data if you want at, at a later point to, to try this. I will put some notebook also at a later time point in the same repository so that you can see how this is done. So you can un, uh, just unzip it. Now this is again on, in my data in the data folder and it's here. And so these are just images. You can even open them actually in, in, in Jupyter and you can have a look at them. Okay, so this is one signal. The, the nuclei uh, signal, which is always the same, this doesn't change with the treatment is the channel number two and it appears like this. Okay, so we're going to do a very crude uh, segmentation of this, of all the images and see if we can get uh, something out. So we import, the first thing we have to import are all the packages we're going to need. Um, so usually I always import uh, the ones I am always using. There are even ways to um, import this, uh, these automatically. Import second image and the importer of image. Um, okay, and now I can, for example, uh, import one image and see how it look like. Looks like um, using imread. And so again, it's two levels up data, and I can go now to this, um, this, and I will open one of the channels two and let's say okay and image is now uh, an array uh, there was one question about ah oh, it's uh, annoying it was about numpy but it's the same in scikit image it's a bit annoying to always have to write uh, all these things so you are not forced to do that you can also import your packages like this you can say uh, from uh, image io import uh, im read as i did before and now you can skip this entire part if you really want that. Uh, you saw that in the notebooks, I almost never do that. Uh, I never do that uh, for two reasons. First, it doesn't take that much typing since you can uh, use this tab auto completion. And so that's done for you. And the second reason is the main reason is that it makes the code much easier to read because you immediately know where your functions are coming from. If by any chance in your uh, notebook or in another module that you wrote, you have a function and you suddenly call it imread, you will not know if it's your function or if it's a function from scikit image. So that's why I tend to never uh, skip the, the place where these functions are coming from. So it makes the code then much easier to read. It's a bit more text to write, but as I said, with auto completion, it's not that bad. Uh, then we can look at the image. And we remember that we can maybe change the color map. Okay, so this is this would be the image. Now we're going to do some simple thing. We are going to do a thresholding. So how can we do thresholding? Uh, how can we choose it? So there is a great function in scikit image. So the thresholding functions are in filters. You see that here, I didn't import filters. So even if I write fi and tab, it doesn't suggest any, anything. So I have first to import it. And so this module is not imported by default. So I have to import it first. Um, when you develop code, you, do, you will probably do exactly what I did here. You realize that you need an additional module and you put it somewhere in the middle of the notebook. Uh, you should really, if you think you're really you're going to need that function or a module, just copy it and put it at the top, okay? Otherwise you're going to have this loading of functions interspersed in your, in your, in your notebook. 
and it's not uh, ideal um, uh, then to, to, to understand what is done in the code. Uh, okay, so filters. And now there is a function in here uh, which is called try all threshold. So you remember that there are examples where I use one of these thresholds. So there you have a choice of lots of different uh, methods. If you do try all, pass your image, and it just tries, uh, we just suppress the output like this. So it tries all these filters and shows you the result. And so then you can pick the one that uh, you think is the best. You can even specify figure size if you think it, this is a bit too small can make the figures a bit larger. Okay, so this is quite handy. It's very similar to uh, the thing you have available also in Fiji. So we are going for, uh, for O2. Um, this is not supposed to be uh, like a, a perfect segmentation. So it's really just to, for illustrations. So we are going to use O2 and like, like this. Okay, and so this is the result of these um, thresholding with the O2 algorithm. So this is the value of the threshold, okay? So now what <clears throat> to actually create a mask, what I would do is say uh, whatever in my image is larger than this threshold, okay? But first I have to define this threshold. So I assign this value to my threshold and now I can do this. You see that the result is a, uh, um, a Boolean array full of uh, true and false values, okay? If I do, uh, if I plot this, uh, I see this, okay? So just uses this weird color map, but you see they have a positive and a negative. Now I want to define a new variable with this. So I just, I can just say, this is going to be my mask, okay? And so there is a slightly weird way of writing things that you saw several times in the notebook, uh, which is very not uh, mathematical. You just have to imagine that you first execute everything which is on the right side of the equal sign and then you assign whatever happened uh, on the right side to this variable, okay? So don't be confused by mask is equal to image and then this is larger than threshold. Uh, what it means is really you do this and then you assign it to mask, okay? But you don't really need the parenthesis, okay? So if I show my mask, this works. Now, when I want to measure the, the properties, uh, what I will want to do is measure the properties of these regions, in particular the intensity. So I will use this mask and I will use it on the other channel because I want to know, to know in the other channel if things moved uh, inside the nucleus or stayed in the cytoplasm. Uh, so I have to create labels and to do labels, I can use, uh, there are in two places in scikit image, this labeling function. And so if I pass a mask, I will call these labels. Now, if I show this, uh, it shows me a labeled image. So this is not optimal, uh, the, the coloring, so I prefer like a random map. This is why I created this random map uh, that you can import, um, which is in this, fun in this little module um, that you had up here. Oops, sorry. Um, Uh, this function called course functions. Okay, so this is a small module where I defined a random map. So let me import this and you see, will see immediately a problem. So I will say from course function and when I tap tab, nothing comes up. Okay, so this is because my notebook here doesn't know about this module. So this module is two level higher than where the notebook is. And so the notebook doesn't have access to this. Okay, so there are multiple ways of solving this. Uh, you can actually write a complete uh, module and uh, put it on PyPy or Conda, and then you can install it. And for these kind of things, it's really uh, an overkill. So either you just copy that file uh, in the same folder where your notebook is. This is not really recommended because you are going to end up with lots of copies of, your, uh, of this file, and then you're going to modify one, but not the other one. So another solution is to put it on GitHub and then just download it every time and make sure that you uh, only use that version and update that version. So that's one other solution. Or you put it somewhere in your, in your computer where you always have access and then you can add the pass to that function inside your, inside your, uh, inside your notebook. And so to do that, 
we can do uh, import the module, a built-in module, which is called sys system. And then if we ask what is the pass, so these are all the passes which are already uh, included um, for this notebook. And you see that most of them are specific to my environment. We're going to see that afterward. So this closed location on my computer, um, but it doesn't have access to my current, uh, to my current pass. So what you can do is do a system pass and up, this is just a list and you can append a pass, okay? And so here I'm just going to append, uh, say, uh, go um, one level higher because my notebooks are just one level higher. So if I do this, um, oh, I, you see that I have I put three P's here. Okay, so now if I ask what is this? Pass, I have these two dots here, which will lead me to the right place. So now if I say from course function, this appears, okay? And I can import my function called random CMAP, and I can say CMAP, and I call that function um, like this. Okay, so now this course function module has appeared because uh, my notebook is going to look for all these places plus just one level higher, okay? And this can be a pass, uh, like a more logical pass, like a specific place on your computer. So you can put the full pass. This is how you can access specific things that you are writing. So these were questions coming up also. And now we can use this color map. And, uh, and this is meant to be superposed to the original image. And we use here a gray color map to avoid uh, mixing all these colors together. And so now you see, uh, I can make it a bit bigger. You saw also that you can uh, specify uh, these settings when you create an image, there are different ways of doing that. Now you have your segmented image. Okay, so now we are happy. Let's say that this is the best thing we, we could achieve. Uh, of course, in, in the real life, you would have something much more advanced than this, and you could even maybe use Stardist, for example, or Cellpose to achieve this, but the end result is the same. You get a, a mask with labels. And now the last thing we want to do is to get information about these regions, okay? Um, so what we have to do is, so this was uh, our first image. This is the second channel, and now we will import um, the, the uh, the first channel. So we're going to call this image one and we need exactly the same image. So they are called the same way. So this is just the position in the, in the 96 well plate. So we would load the channel one. We can have a look at image one. Okay, so this is looks more like cytoplasm. And what we're going to use is this region props um, uh, function. So um, it's in the measure module region props table. So what we have to pass here is the labels, our image with labels. And we can pass an intensity image. What this is so you can either measure the geometrical properties of all your labels, like the area, the roundness, uh, convexity, all, all these things. But if you pass a second image here, um, you can pass an intensity image and then it's going to measure, for example, the average intensity, the maximum intensity in each of these regions. Okay. So here I'm passing my image from the channel one. Then I have to specify what properties I want. And so I want the label uh, and I want uh, the mean, let me just this, the mean intensity. So this you have to look up the, the keywords you can look up uh, on Google. You could just type like image region props and you have a whole list of these uh, available. And I will call this regions. Now, this is what I have. So it's a, it's a dictionary and it has label and values for in the intensity array. And so each of these corresponds to one of these regions uh, up here. What I can do now is what I will do uh, later is to transform this into pandas data frame. So maybe you saw that I, I was using um, pandas a bit in a very rudimentary way. Pandas as as PD and you can transform this into a data frame. So if you are familiar with 
uh, R. This is very similar. So this becomes like a nice list with labels and rows uh, that you can easily use. Okay, so now we think that this is working pretty much uh, okay. So now we want to do this for all the images, right? We need to do this for all the images. And so we have to go through all uh, the images in the folder. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, of course, you can, for example, say that you have a, a main pass uh, and copy this and then have some way of, uh, of finding what the content of this is, of the folder is, and say things like main pass uh, plus uh, maybe this image, okay? And you would have a list that you, that you go through. And now you would have to put a slash. And so this, uh, no, this you would put your slash here. And so you would um, end up with this pass, which is okay, uh, but is okay on my computer, right? Uh, this pass that adds these uh, slashes here is okay on Linux or on Mac, but not on the PC. On the PC, you would have, for example, backslashes. So this is going to be difficult to reuse on another computer. So the better way of defining this, these passes is to use a, um, a more uh, global way of defining passes. And so there are two ways. Uh, now, I think for the sake of time, I will show the, 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 the easier one. So there is a module called OS. So you can import OS. And OS has all functions to deal with passes and folders. And there is a submodule called pass. For example, this has a function called join. And if you do join, you just pass this. This you will always have to set differently depending on your, on your computer. But then I can just pass this name. Oops, I need the quotes. And this creates a pass for me. So you see it added for me this slash and it would add it uh, di differently depending on my computer. So if I was working on Windows, I would actually get the right uh, formatting for, for this pass, okay? So this is what, uh, what you, what you should, uh, should be using. So this is quite, a, quite, an important, uh, quite an important part because you are going to deal with passes all the time um, uh, with this. Now there is another module we're going to use, which is called glob. And glob allows us to parse the contents of files. So if I do glob, uh, glob. Again, these are all things you, of course, you have to know, you have to Google. Um, uh, um, I'm going to copy this. And now what you do, so you have a pass and you say you, you complete it as you want. So if I just, and you use star, to say, okay, take whatever, and I can say whatever ends with this extension, okay? Um, I have a parent, uh, yeah, I'm just missing a quote here. So this creates a list of all the files that uh, conform to this uh, in my folder, okay? So now I want two of these lists, one for channel one and one for channel two. So what I can do is say channel uh, one, and I would just skip this. Okay, so now I have a list of all, only the channel one. It's a huge list and you see that it's not really ordered. To order it, I can use NumPy and say sort, for example, there are multiple ways of doing this. This works well. So now I have A, one, two, three, four, five. This has been formatted and written in a nice way. Uh, it's not always the case, um, but this works fine. So this is my files uh, one for channel one and I will just copy this and do this same thing for files two. Uh, okay, and so now I can, uh, I will just suppress this for the confusing people. And so now I can uh, open imread. I don't need these passes anymore. I can open, for example, the first element. Okay. And this is uh, channel two. So I will call this image one and image two, and I can have a look at image one. This is the cytoplasm and uh, this is the nuclei. Okay, so now, and we can do that for all these uh, indices, okay? And since we order them, we are sure, and we have the same numbers in two channels, in the two channels, we are sure that they are corresponding. Okay, and now you can apply the pipeline we had before to all these, uh, these images. 
so we are going to create an empty list uh, that in which we will put uh, all the results and then we do a for loop. So we do for index in uh, the range and this is going to be just how many elements we have in in the files one. There are more advanced ways of doing this, but let's keep it simple for this. And now I, for each element in my loop, I'm just going to import these images. So I need here index, index, and, and now I would just suppress this, this, and now I will measure the threshold on the channel two, because this is where I have the nuclei. I will create the mask. I will create the label. And this is really typically how I work and I think many people work. So you try something out on an image. Once you have something that works, you include it in a, in a complete loop where you go through all the, uh, through all the through all the data in your in your data set and the final thing that we need is this so this is going to measure the regions and uh, we're going to transform this into a data frame okay and finally if we don't save this every at every time we, we go through the loop we're going to er erase this result here so what, and we need to correct this um, image too. Um, we are uh, going to append all these results slowly. So we are making a list of data frames. So we append the regions here. And so now I don't really need this anymore. My results is a list of data frames. So if I take the first one, this is a data frame. This is a data frame. Now I have no way of knowing which data frame corresponds to uh, what file, except if I go back through my original list here. So I can include that in my, uh, in my data frame directly. So I will just add a, a column. I will call it file. And I will say that this is um, I will take this name here. Um, and I will do it slightly differently. So if I, if I take this files here um, and I take the first element, so this is the entire pass, you can split this, uh, for example, using the, the backslashes um, and take the last element. So this gives you the name here of the file. This, there are many ways of doing this. There are more elegant ways of doing this, um, especially using a, a module called passlib. So you could import passlib. Uh, you should really go read about passlib. It's a bit too complicated for today, but you should try to use passlib in, 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 your, in your work. Um, so we are going to add this actually to our data frame. Okay. So we need here the index. So if we do this um, and look at one of our results, we see that now we have the labels, the mean intensity, and the name of the file. Okay, it, it automatically adds it to each line. The last thing we need, we would need, is to know um, uh, which uh, row and which uh, column that is in our plate. And to do that, you can use regular expressions. So I'm going to really briefly show you regular expressions. And I'm completely aware that this is, um, if you never heard about this, uh, it's going to be difficult to understand. But I re if you don't know what they are, I really encourage you to discover what they are. So regular expressions allow you to find patterns of uh, text um, in, 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 uh, in, in, in strings. Uh, and so there is a module in Python that does this, a built-in module called RE for regular expressions. And now you can create a pattern. So my pattern here will be something, something is written like a dot and a star, whatever uh, thing. And then I have a, a dash that you see here. Um, then I have uh, something, which is here the column. Um, I think it's a column. Um, and then you have a dash, you have 
the, um, uh, the, 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 the row A here, and then you have something. Okay, and so now if you, uh, if you, for example, have just a string here, you're going to look for this pattern. And so you have to say what you want to keep. So we are going to try to keep this. And so we put parentheses, uh, sorry, this uh, first uh, element here, and we're going to put the parentheses and hope that it works. And it, this takes us uh, A, okay? So this is the, 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 the way to recover these, these, uh, these elements. So I think Seprofiler has the same thing. Yeah, you can also define these patterns. Uh, and this is a way to recover information from the file name itself. Um, and if we recover now the other one, um, I will just add um, this. So this recovers this, uh, this second element. And so you can recover it like this. So you have just one element. You can even uh, convert it to a, um, to a number. So this gives you an integer. This will give you an actual list, uh, list for this. Okay, so now you can add these elements again into your uh, large uh, data frame. So you can say, uh, what is my uh, plate row and, uh, and my plate column. So my plate column is going to be this for a specific name. And the row is going to be the same thing, except that we are not uh, taking, this is just a, a, a letter. And so we don't uh, convert it to an integer. Okay, so now if I ask what the result is, I see that this now gives me this result. Okay, and if I go to the next plate, I see that it's still plate row A, but the, the column is two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so if I go further, I C seven, etc. So this gives me the reference to that uh, to that plate here. Okay, so you probably, if you know no regular expressions, you were completely confused by what I just did now. Uh, but you see for what it can be used. So just go uh, try to learn uh, learn about it. So now we can finally plot our information, right? So we, we can first um, um, concatenate this, so we can put all these uh, tables together. So now um, all results is just a huge uh, list uh, data frame with all the information, but the mean intensity for each plate, for all the elements in each plate, uh, and we still have the reference to the position inside that plate. Okay, and this is now where you have the strengths of the, of the, of the data frames uh, that you can do uh, um, uh, uh, data science directly in your notebook. Okay, so you can do, for example, a group by, so we can group by a certain uh, certain element. So we can group by the file file uh, name and take an average, and so we see what comes out of this. You have new a new list, but now we have averaged the mean intensity for all the elements uh, in our plate. Um, uh, so you get can get all the statistics you want. Uh, doing this and you can do much more complicated uh, uh, combinations or groupings. Um, but uh, yes, this is where you have the data science strengths that really, that, uh, really comes in.
So I will just, and then you can plot uh, your results. So for example, um, you can, I just copy this to avoid too much typing. So now that I have grouped, so I can create a new uh, data frame here and call it grouped. Um, you can group, uh, uh, you can use the index uh, to plot and then you can plot the, the mean intensity. Okay, and so the index, the index is the file name and then you have the average intensity uh, of um, fluorescence within the nucleus, but in the channel that you are actually interested in, not in the nucleus. You rarely measure intensity in the same channel as where you, you actually segment. And you see that we see a sort of a pattern here, increasing uh, pattern, um, but this is still difficult to read, right? But you have all your files here. Uh, what you can do next is doing something a bit more fancy. So you can do a second uh, grouping. Now you can group by rows and by columns, right? So you can just group all these things together and calculate the mean. So if I look at what this contains, this is a big table with references to the plate row and plate column and uh, the labels we don't need anymore, but we have an average mean intensity over the entire plate, okay? Now for each of these, I have uh, uh, multiple points that corresponds to these different columns here, treated at different levels. And I can see, I can see uh, my, my result. And for example, I can just do a small for loop and plot each of these groups. So you see that I get uh, groups uh, of a certain row. This is how you do indexing in pandas. Uh, it's a bit similar to, to, to num NumPy. And you can do a plot for each separate curve. So this is each of these lines corresponds to a certain uh, row here. And uh, each point corresponds to uh, these uh, um, columns here. And you see that in the columns, treatments were done at different levels of a certain drug. Uh, that changes how much this protein is found in the nucleus. Um, and, uh, and you see that the result uh, actually, fit, if you, you, you can go and check, fits actually the, 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 the expectation. So we have first negative controls, and then we have increasing amounts of this drug. And so we should have more and more fluorescence uh, uh, across uh, these columns. And so this is exactly what you see. And these first points here are controls. They're different uh, depending on the row, and you can also check that, that, they, that they are matching. So you saw that in, in, with not that much effort, we have a small loop here to analyze all the files. You can create a data frame and then have access to all the data science capabilities of, of Python and Jupyter to do this kind of, uh, of plots. And this is already quite a complicated thing to do, but it's, uh, it becomes really easy using, using Pandas. The last note uh, that will bring us to the, to the next topic, you can uh, mix languages in your, in your notebook. So for example, here, um, uh, I want to import, this is just to uh, uh, be safe of a bug that uh, I discovered. Um, uh, I will load an extension. So you will see that there are these magic commands. I will talk about this in a moment. And then you can use R. And so I use actually ggplot, which is very popular. So I import uh, ggplot uh, here, and then I use a regular uh, R syntax to do this plot. Okay, and so this is still in my Jupyter notebook. And you see that it produces the, the regular default plot that you get in ggplot, okay? For this, I just had to install R on my computer and the package that allows me to push and pull uh, data between the, the two worlds. So in addition to all the data science you can do by default using Python tools, if you are really familiar with R and like ggplot, um, you can use this. There are like ports of ggplot in, in Python. One of them is called plot9, which is really good. So if you want to stay in Python, you can and have the same kind of uh, syntax uh, that you have in ggplot. 
Okay, so you have seen here things which are very similar to, to what was done in the notebooks, like the region props, the labeling things. This stays at the very simple level. But I wanted to give you this additional information on how you should handle uh, the passes if you need to have import a module that you wrote. I wanted to give you some information how you deal with multiple images, how you can parse the content of a folder, um, how you can recover information from the file name. So this was really fast, I'm completely aware of it, but really try to understand uh, what these regular expressions are doing. This is extremely helpful. And then you can create as an output a data frame and use pandas um, to do the data science part uh, on, this, um, on this analysis. And you see that you end up with the plot. Of course, you would have to improve it, uh, add labels. This is just a very default plot. Uh, but you could actually use that to put in a publication and then everything is in your one notebook. Okay, so this is the, the illustration I wanted to do. I will uh, put a version, a clean version of this uh, on GitHub so that you can uh, have a look at it if, uh, if you are interested. Um, but I wanted to, to show you also not just the, co the content of the code, but also how I do it and also, for example, that you can use these tabs which are uh, very, very helpful. Um, yeah, we just go here. So to, to use R, you need a regular installation of R, um, like you download it from the regular place. Then you create the Conda environment. We're going to see that in a moment. So a specific place to install things. You will install Jupyter plus all the other packages you need. Then you have to run R uh, from a terminal, like the regular R and install the packages and run these two commands. So this is from a package called IR kernel. And then you need an additional package in your, in your repository, uh, in your um, environment called RPy2. This is all you need to be able to mix languages uh, like I just did. And you saw that uh, here, what you have to do is in this first cell, you have to say that this cell talks in R. And so this is what you do with this uh, um, person person sign. So this means that this entire cell here is going to be written in R. And these additional elements here say that I'm, I'm pushing a variable called grouped uh, inside that, that cell so that I have, have access, uh, access to it. Okay, uh, of course, you will probably run into, into, into trouble. These, these uh, ways of mixing code are very powerful, but uh, somehow power comes always with complexity. So you might run into, into trouble. You find a lot of information on internet, on Stack Overflow, you can post on, uh, on different forums. Uh, but in principle, it works not uh, uh, without too much, uh, too much trouble. Um, and then I will go to this uh, afterwards. I'm just uh, going probably to take a few questions if there are questions that have not been answered. Uh, yeah, so there is one question. Could you suggest a good book manual slash web page where we can start approach to Python specific for image analysis? Um, unfortunately, not really. Um, so there are lots of books about data science. I think I put the references uh, to my to my favorite book uh, by by Jake Van der Plas. But there there is no uh, a reference book I would say for bioimage analysis in Python. So you find uh, courses like this, uh, you find other courses um, uh, on GitHub uh, using uh, notebooks. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say that there is a reference like there is for, uh, exa uh, for example, for data science. Or for Java, there is a reference book uh, with code for Java. But I, to my knowledge, there, there isn't. So if anybody has a good book about this, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to, to, to hear about it. There are, of course, uh, books, but uh, none that I'm really familiar with or that I would really recommend. Well, there is no other questions so far. Okay, very good. Um, then I will uh, keep on. So we saw that here we make... Uh, yes? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Maria Nitham suggests Python programming for biology by Tim Stevens. Okay, very good. So I will, will try to find it and put it uh, 
as a, as a reference on the MHSC forum as a question. I will just put it as a question. Okay, and if there are any other references coming up, I will add them there. Suggest. Okay, um, so you saw very briefly here that you can mix R and, uh, and Python. Uh, installation is not too complicated. Uh, you can use, of course, also uh, command lines. And so we saw that a little bit already last time, but I just want to uh, uh, remind you that uh, you can, there are two ways of doing this. You can use the exclamation points and use, uh, for example, knowing what your current path is, uh, knowing what the current content of your, of your folder is. You can do this. Um, the other, some of them are even actually available without, uh, without exclamation points. So just that you know, the very uh, basic ones are even available without this. Um, but you can also, just like we use in R, we use these two uh, uh, person sign. We can use person signs for a bash, for example. So bash is one of the main languages for, uh, in the command line. So if I say this, it means that my entire cell here is going to be bash. And um, um, this means that I can do things like uh, CD, like go one level up and ask what is the content one level up. Okay, so this gives me the content one level up. This is where my notebooks were. So you see that it really executes all these things in one, in, uh, in, as if you had opened uh, a, a, a terminal. So you didn't really move in your notebook between in these locations, but within this cell, you went one level up and you asked what was the, what was the constant and you, the, 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 con the content. Uh, um, and you can even uh, show the, the, the current path. So I'm using this in some notebooks, I think, uh, and the notebook that you're going to see now, I'm doing this, uh, using this to write some bash code. So this is also interesting if you need to download large data sets, for example, from Colab, uh, and then you can use this we get um, uh, tool um, and you can then unzip things. So you can do a lot of things you wouldn't do in the command line separately. You can do them in the notebook. And in that way, whenever you run your notebook, all these uh, commands are executed. So you don't need to first open a command line, execute a bunch of things, and then open your notebook and execute the notebook. You can do everything from that notebook. Okay, and so this is what I want to illustrate now. So there, I made an additional notebook. Uh, I was a bit frustrated by the fact that it was not possible to run uh, uh, Fiji properly, or it was difficult to run Fiji in, in Google Colab. So if you tried it, maybe you saw that uh, it wasn't working very smoothly. On Binder, it worked uh, well. I tried and tried it uh, just before. But so in Google, on Colab, uh, not. And on Colab, you have access to GPUs, right? So if you want access to GPU for Fiji, or if you want to mix Fiji and MHJ, uh, it would be nice to be able to use Colab if you don't have access yourself to a, to a good GPU. And in particular, if you want to use Klish. So Klish is this uh, plugin for GPU computing in Fiji and in other languages. Um, and it would be great if we could use that uh, in Colab in, in a notebook. And so I tried this uh, inspired by different uh, uh, notebooks and posts on the MHSC forum. Uh, and so I came up with this, uh, with this solution. So you can use this link, you can open this notebook also um, so I put some explanations if you want to go through it later. But you see that here, for example, in this first, uh, in this first cell, so the first thing you have to do is to change the runtime. Uh, you want to use a GPU, right? This is the goal of this whole thing. Um, uh, and here I'm executing all the installation of whatever you need to run uh, in Fiji. Uh, on your uh, on on Colab, so you install Java, you install different libraries, and PyMHJ. This library I was mentioning last time. Uh, I, I will do it. I'm not sure how fast it's going to go, so maybe I will come back to this later. See that this tells you that it's running. Then I'm downloading a Fiji version to install, uh, and then I'm installing Klish directly in Colab in that uh, in that. Um, 
Fiji version that I downloaded. Okay, so here I downloaded it, unzip it, and here I'm moving to the Fiji app and I'm installing. You can do that actually by the command line I discovered. You can add update sites uh, directly from the command line. And so this is Clision Fish 2. And we execute this too. So you see that you know, you're getting a lot of messages. It's downloading uh, all the things that are needed. Um, and then you arrive in the part where you actually want to use it. And so, of course, you have to wait until everything is installed to be able to, to run this. Um, so I will see uh, how fast this goes. So it's still stuck in the first. Okay, so it's it's finished installing this. Now it's downloading Fiji, and uh, I think I will I will just come back to this in a minute and go a bit further in the in the presentation. And then we will come back to this. So yeah, so there are a few more things I wanted to mention about Jupyter. Uh, so there is this other version of Jupyter, which is called Jupyter Lab. And you can ex install it using uh, Conda, for example, very easily. And you can switch between the two, the two worlds. Um, so if I go back to here, if you just, uh, if you just remove whatever is after tree here, so they have tree and whatever comes after, and you write lab. You can do that on binder. On binder, uh, Jupyter Lab is installed. Then it, it opens the Jupyter, Jupyter Lab interface. And this is a bit more advanced. I tried to I use Jupyter notebooks, so the classical ones for courses, because they are easier to understand. But if you, have, if you want, you can try to use Jupyter Lab. You see that you have these tabs opening, not directly in your browser, but in a, like in the sub window. And if you have multiple of them open, you see that you have a browser of your data here directly, and you can open multiple of those tabs. And they will open uh, like this, and you can even split your images, split your uh, your uh, work in, workspace into two. So you can have two notebooks in case you want to copy paste things. Um, and there are lots of other tools. So then you have them, then these tabs where you can stop notebooks. And you have a lot of extensions that you can install. So I'm not demonstrating this here, but know that this, uh, this exists and this is probably the future version of, uh, of Jupyter. It, it, the feeling is closer to what you have in MATLAB, for example, where you have multiple windows that, uh, that you can use. Okay, so just know that this exists and you can go uh, back and forth. If you install both Jupyter and Jupyter Lab, you can go back and forth between these two, right? So if I write back tree here, I'm back here and my notebooks stay running between these two. So it's purely an interface uh, difference. Okay, so you can discover Jupyter Lab on your own if you, if you think it's interesting. And then there was the point of extensions. Um, so last time somebody asked, for example, if it was possible to see variables. Um, and so there are extensions that you can uh, use. So you have to install for Ju the classic Jupyter notebook, you have to install uh, this thing called Jupyter Contribution uh, NB Extensions. It's also a Conda install that you see here. It's very easy. And then you will have access to this menu here, NB Extensions, with a lot of uh, possibilities. So what I was using here was the, um, the table of content, uh, uh, which is somewhere has disappeared behind my window. Uh, yeah, table of contents is here. Uh, this is what gave the possibility to when you open, uh, you can see what is running here. To have, now I have too many things open. You see that my computer is kind of struggling. So this gives you this table of content. And some of these uh, extensions, they come with additional uh, icons here. So the table of contents, for example, is here. You can uh, turn it on and off. This is another one, this is a spell checker. So if you want to spell check whatever you wrote, you, you can use it. And then there is one to do, um, uh, to see variables. Uh, now, just right now, I forgot how it is, a uh, variable inspector. So variable inspector is available here. Um, let's see here what we have. So if I make this smaller again, uh, we see here, this is my variable inspector and I have all the variables that I had defined, okay? 
So these are all the variables I defined. So you see it tells you this is a data frame, the size of the data frame, the shape for NumPy arrays. It does this too, so it gives you the shape of things. So this is, uh, can be quite useful. And you have the equivalent in JupyterLab. So this exists also in JupyterLab. Okay, so these are the two additional things that I want to, to, to mention here. And now we just finally go back um, to, uh, to this. So now it's done um, installing everything. Uh, I just have to restart the runtime uh, for some reason. It's, this is like restarting your kernel. Uh, but so everything which you installed here is valid and as for as long as your session is, is on. Then I'm importing some packages and uh, uh, to run uh, Fiji in, 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 in uh, Python. And this, this is ImageJ corresponding to this PyImageJ uh, package plus some additional like, uh, Java classes to be able to recover data. So then you uh, start this, so you see that this, these different commands take variables amount of, of time uh, because I don't know exactly what happens in the, in the background on, on Colab. Um, but once it's running, the, the, the code itself is running fast. So it's just the, the loading and the setup, which can be sometimes a bit tedious. Um, so I don't know if I should wait and hope that this is going not to take too long. Anyway, I can also already explain you what happens here. So if you looked at the notebook, you saw that we can actually use macros in, uh, in notebooks. So here I define a macro and you see that it contains the same kind of commands you have when you do uh, macro recording in Fiji. Okay, and it's just defined as text. So you have this triple quotes, everything which is in there is just like macro commands. So you can really record your macro in Fiji and then copy paste the text in here. You can pass some variables if you're familiar with this. And then you can run, just run your macro using uh, PyImageJ. So you say run macro. And here I'm loading this blobs, uh, blobs picture. And then uh, this is, for example, using Clij, right? So this, these are the commands right, that you get when you want to run Clij in, uh, in Fiji. And so you blur, uh, here I'm doing a 2D blur, a Gaussian blurring of my input image and I'm getting it out by getting the current, uh, current image. So this is also how you would do in a similar way, probably in Fiji, you will get, there are different ways of doing this, but you can get the last, uh, the last available image. So this is one way of running this. I will show once it's loaded, how you can really run it. The other way is to run to, ah, it's done. So let's run this. And I have a really large Sigma. So it's going to do a lot of blurring. And you see that you will get a very blurred image. So this really used the, the cliche uh, from, from Fiji. The other way is to use cliche Pi. So uh, there is a version of cliche for the, directly for Python. So you need an installation of Fiji and cliche, and then you can load this specific package. And then I'm loading a new, a new array. So this is just NumPy array. Then you can go through the code, but you do some pushing and pulling of images to the GPU and uh, you do blur, okay? So this is where you do the blurring. I used five here for Sigma. Um, and then you can show uh, the image. So you see that this is, this is pure Python code and this gives you this result. And um, you can put a larger value for one axis to be, make, be sure that you really do what you, what you think. So this really did the blurring using the GPU um, uh, that is present on Collab. So if you want to be sure of this, you can uh, print, uh, see that you have also some uh, autocomplete um, in, uh, I think there is somewhere to get uh, an information. Uh, right now I forgot how, how to get this information uh, well if you if you know the command you can really detect that you're using using this gpu which is uh, i think a tesla your gpu anyway so you can explore this you can either use it directly in python or via macro uh, and directly on column so i think that's pretty cool at the cost of some uh, installation that is quite tricky to do but which exploits the fact that you can install things directly 
from, uh, from the notebook. Okay, so and yeah, you can follow the link and just see how it's done yourself. I, I don't pretend that I understand everything which is done here. So this is uh, the reference here to where I found this information. But uh, as long as it works, uh, everybody's happy. Okay, so I will take questions at the very end if there is still time, but I really want to go through that uh, installation um, part, which I think is really important for everyone. And uh, we'll take questions uh, on, on everything at the very end. I think we'll do a bit uh, over, over, we'll overrun slightly, but um, not too much. So remember that I said that often people get stuck here. I got many questions about installations, but I guess many people wanted to uh, run the, the course on their own laptop. Um, and some people got stuck at different places, but essentially they experienced exactly this. So I just want to go really a bit in detail on how you can do that. So you have a computer and um, naively you can say, okay, I installed I install the Python or have already Python installed and I have packages. So all this lives on my computer and is available um, to me when I use Jupyter, for example. Okay, and, and they're globally available all the time. So that there is going to be one problem with this and the problem is the following. Um, um, you are going to have issues of version. So this is an, a problem that many people, so that several people had to run the course that in one of the notebooks, I'm using the region props table uh, function that we already, that we also saw in the demo. Um, and it's because they had an old version of scikit-image and this function appeared uh, uh, in the version 0.16. And so they couldn't really uh, use this function. So I told them you can update it and they run into other kinds of problems. And you see that I recreated this here. I installed an old version of scikit-image just to show you what, uh, what happened. So this is how, you can also get the version. Okay, so what you do then is you say, okay, then I'm just going to upgrade my, uh, my package and you can, for example, do that with pip. So you say pip install scikit image and you select a new version. What happens is this. And when you install a new version, it, it not only installs a scikit image, but a lot of other packages that scikit image depends on, like NumPy and one of them is image IO to do imports and what you will see is that the, it has a requirement that the image IO should be larger than a certain version. The version of image IO should be larger than this. So it, it, it finds one on my uh, laptop which was already there and then installs it. So it uninstalls uh, one which was too old to install this new uh, 0.16 version of scikit image and installs a new one. Okay, so now you're happy. You can um, uh, uh, use scikit image. You can use that function because you have a new version of um, uh, of um, region prop of um, you have a new version of psychic imaging. Um, but the, the collateral effect is that you also updated other packages, right? And what happens a lot of the time is the following. So now you're happy, you have psychic image, uh, and this required this package. So you have an updated version of psychic image. Now we have another project, and in that other project, you need another package, and that other package. Uh, uh, also uses image IO, but has another requirement and it requires the version to be exactly this version. Okay. This is quite rare, but, uh, but it can happen. Okay, so now you have installed this and now you install a new package and it requires exactly this. So since things are living in the same space, how are you going to do that? Okay, and so the problem you are, you're going to have is uh, this. So when you're trying to install that old version of image IO, to conform uh, to the version for your other package, you will get an error. And that says that scikit image 0.16 has a requirement of a certain ver version, but you will have image IO 2.0.1. So now your new package works, but your scikit image doesn't work anymore because it relied on another version of the image IO. Okay, and so this is a typical uh, thing called dependency hell that you, will, uh, that you might experience when you install things in Python. And so this is why uh, we use environments to somehow um, isolate the things we do on the computer, okay? So what we want is to have for each project an environment, so they're really close on your computer. And so each one can live its own life with its own versions of packages. And it's not only these two packages, you can have different versions of Python, you can have uh, different Jupyters, uh, so you can have 
Everything that you need is enclosed in this uh, little box here, and this little box is called an environment. And then whenever you want to do something on project two, you will use environment two, project one, environment one, okay? And these things are going to be independent. Um, so the best way of creating this environment, in my opinion, is to use Conda. So Conda is really creating these environments. It's called a Conda environment then. So the first thing you have to do is uh, install Conda on your computer. So there are mainly two ways of doing this. You can use Anaconda. This installs a lot of packages, plus um, the Conda software itself. Or you can use Miniconda. So Miniconda has much less packages, just the basic, uh, the basic uh, Conda. Um, since you install new packages anyway, I recommend using Miniconda because uh, you don't need the several gigabytes of software that comes with Anaconda. So you can go on the Miniconda website, they're installers, you download them, you double click, you really install them like a regular, uh, like a regular software. Then if everything went all right and you agreed to all the defaults, uh, the next time you open the terminal, uh, like in, uh, in, on Linux or Mac, you open your the, the terminal. In Windows, you have to open what is called the Anaconda prompt, which is it's a software that gets installed when you install a Miniconda or Anaconda. The next time you open your uh, terminal, you will see this uh, additional thing uh, of, of the thing you usually says, like your username, and it's called base. And base is the, the base environment of Conda. Okay, so. Uh, the picture is slightly different. So in your computer, you have the Conda world and you have the rest of your computer and these things are completely separate. So you might have already things installed in your computer, Python, Psychedimage, whatever. And you can reinstall everything uh, in the Conda world, okay? And the Conda world is based in the base. The base is also an environment. Uh, it's an environment that somehow contains, or I don't know how to exactly explain this, but, but that is available every time you, you start a terminal, right? So it's the first um, environment that you have access to and which contains also Conda, okay? So Conda is run from that base environment. And so this can have packages. If you install Anaconda, you will have all packages, plus your environment. So again, the environments that you want to create, okay? And so each of these things are separate, okay? So that these two words don't talk together, and the base and the environment uh, one and two don't talk together. So they are very, they are, they are separate. Now there is one uh, 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 rule with Conda is that you should uh, not use the base environment. Just leave it, but don't use it to do uh, coding. So I was reminded by this, by a post on the MIGLC forum by uh, Juan Nunez Iglesias who, who said, uh, we should um, amend some of the answer and this is exactly this so really important rules so there are three rules don't use the base environment don't use the base environment but it's really important the reason for this is that eventually you will break your environment and by breaking i mean that you will install you will have a mix of things installed that will eventually have conflicts that are unsolvable and you will end up with an error message uh, that says i could not install uh, these things and you're going to really struggle uh, to solve these issues, so uninstalling parts of uh, software. Uh, so you really don't want to do that in the base environment that you cannot suppress. So you have to create uh, special environments and those special environments, once you run into this kind of issue, you can really, uh, you can destroy them, you can just suppress them and start from scratch. Um, okay, so this actually happened to me when I wanted to I wanted to demo what happens in a, in a bad case. So I installed the different things, different versions, and suddenly I got this message. But it takes, I have to say, that it takes some efforts to break, a, to break an environment. So in 90% of the cases, when you install regular software, it, this won't happen. If you start using typically machine learning software like uh, TensorFlow or especially TensorFlow, you will run into, into these kind of issues. Okay. Another problem that you might have is if you work in the base environment, especially you have a lot of things installed, notably a uh, Python version. Uh, and if you try to upgrade a scikit image, for example, uh, and it, you have a certain, an old Python version, for example, because you installed Anaconda or Miniconda two years ago, uh, when you say upgrade scikit image, it won't upgrade it 
because scikit image uh, of more advanced versions cannot work with uh, this early Python version. Okay, so this is what some MP people experience when they try to upgrade. They told me, yeah, but I upgraded, upgraded, but nothing happened. And this is why, right? You have an old Python version, so you would first need to upgrade Python. This is going to break all the other packages uh, so that scikit image works. Okay, and so your environment will be uh, broken. So really do these things in specific environments. And now this doesn't want to move anymore. Okay, so how do we create an environment? How do we create these closed spaces? To create these closed spaces, you use this conda create command, and then you give a name. Uh, you call it my env, or you can call it, um, I called it biapi, for example, for, for the course. And then you usually install at least one package. If you don't install anything, it's going to be empty, not even Python, not even pip, nothing in there. So you will install, for example, second image. So you go on their website and they tell you, okay, this is the command that you should run, conda install. And you have one additional piece of information, which is this. So these are called flags. So these are options, sort of options. Uh, this is a channel. So you have these packages available from different sources, let's say. One of the most popular one is Conda Forge. So you can add this as a, as a, as a, as a specification. Uh, usually if you don't, there are default uh, sources that also work. So in, as long as you don't, know, don't do really advanced things, you should not have trouble uh, with, this, with these versions. And then you say the, the package name. So this is going to create an environment called myn, and it's going to install uh, from the beginning scikit image. Okay, so you can execute this in your, in your command line. And when you see I executed this, what it, it installs a lot of other packages. I just highlighted a few, numpy, because num, it depends on numpy. It installs pip. So now you can also install other packages with pip by default. It installs a version of Python. If you don't specify anything, it's going to take the latest one, which is this one, and scikit image, of course. See, so a lot of things get installed at the same time. Uh, now to use these environments that you created, this little box inside your uh, uh, conda, conda space, uh, you need to activate it. So you use conda activate my env. Uh, on Windows, you might have to use source activate my env. Um, if it doesn't work, you will Google it and the first tag overflow answer will be uh, your solution. Now, once you have activated your environment, whatever you do will happen in that environment. So if you install new things, it will happen in that environment, not in the base environment and not for your whole computer, only in that environment. Okay, so for example, we installed pandas. So here I said conda installed pandas, but you see that I have my environment activated and you see it here and this parenthesis, this says my, no more base, it says my env. So I created an environment called my env and now it uses this environment to do the installation. Okay, and so everything is installed. And the same for Jupyter and the same for a lot of other packages. You can, of course, also use pip. So for example, the AICS uh, image IO package can only be installed by pip if you go on their website. And so they tell you use pip install uh, this. So since pip has been installed previously, uh, you remember here, it's available in your environment called my end. So now you can execute pip install ACS image IO and it installs all the things that are needed in there. So you can use both pip and conda. I recommend using conda whenever you can because conda really uh, makes sure that the package uh, versions are compatible, uh, but you can use both. Now, if you want to automate this entire process, you can write a little environment file that looks like this. It's a YAML language. Uh, you give a name to your environment. Uh, you can specify we don't have two channels, for example, Conda Forge, and then you say what you want to install. Okay. And so instead of writing Conda install and all these packages, you can just make a list here, and you can even say what should be also installed via pip. So for example, AICS and uh, Image IO is installed by pip. So this is all contained in this environment file. And then the only thing you have to do is run this command. So you save this file on your computer, you move to the right place on your terminal, or you import it in Anaconda uh, interface and you say conda create environment. Okay, here you would call it environment minimal. And this is going to run through all the, the installation and uh, take care of everything for you. And at the, at the very end, uh, you get a message that tells you um, 
you, a message like this uh, that tells you to activate this environment, use conda activate my env, and this is going to have whatever name you selected uh, in this file here. Okay, so here you would say conda activated by apply. So this file here is available in the GitHub repository in the installation, uh, I, I put the reference uh, in the installation um, folder. So you can download it on your computer, install it. It's a minimal installation in the sense that there is no cell pose and no star list, which are slightly more complicated to install. So if you need that, uh, just go on their GitHub pages and they will tell you exactly how to do it. Um, and you see that you can specify versions. For example, here Python 3.7, because cell pose needs exactly this version of, uh, of, of Python and I just left it in this, in this example. Okay, so to summarize, if you write all these uh, uh, lines in your terminal, you will have a functioning conda environment that has scikit image. This is a conda environment that you create called my end. You activate it, never forget to activate. You install Jupyter. Then you install uh, with pip uh, AI CS image IO. And finally, you can write, uh, run uh, Jupyter. And to run Jupyter, you type Jupyter notebook. Um, yeah, don't, don't uh, create uh, completely empty environments because you're going to run into trouble. So at least install one package and then the other ones. Uh, but I really recommend uh, using these uh, environment files. Now my computer is again not responding. Okay, using these environment files. Okay, and then you will end up with really closed environments, no conflicts of versions. And uh, I think it's, it's pretty easy to do, right? So if you want to install cell pose and you had tr trouble before, you can download their environment.yaml file and install it uh, using this, uh, this, this command. And you should not run into any, any trouble, okay? So Conda will really simplify your, uh, simplify your life. Uh, and this is uh, the end uh, of this uh, presentation. So I, uh, took uh, quite a lot of time to about uh, for this for this installation because I really think uh, it's important if you want to continue using Python. Uh, I really encourage you to use uh, Conda. So uh, um, maybe there was not that much time for you to ask uh, live questions, but I really wanted to go through this. So uh, the material will stay online and interactive beyond the course. So on Collab or on Binder, they will both remain active. And all the questions uh, will be are or and will be posted on the MHSC uh, SC forum. And uh, with that, I think we I mean, will overrun a few minutes, but we can take uh, questions if there are about any of these uh, topics. And thanks for your attention. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a couple of questions here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. What are the major differences between Python and R, or what are the benefits to use R instead of Python? Oh, I think in a large part, it's really a question of, uh, of taste, um, of how this, I mean, they have very different syntaxes. So some people really love the R syntax, some people love the Python syntax. This is a question of taste. Then there is a question of domains of applications. Um, R is really good at statistics. Um, if you really have to do statistical analysis, uh, R, I think, uh, has a sort of an edge because lots of people use it. There are great packages in Python, like stats model, for example. Um, for all the data science part, I think it's pretty equivalent. Uh, you have the, like the tidy version R and the, the, the Python ecosystem around the pandas. These are quite... Um, Quite similar. I would say for image processing, Python is, is clearly, uh, clearly ahead, right? Because especially uh, because of uh, all the deep learning advances that have been done in, uh, in Python. So both uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are the main libraries, are uh, written in Python uh, and in lower level languages, but mainly in Python. Um, so if you do image processing, I don't think you should do, use R. You can use it as I showed for the data analysis part, but uh, not for the image processing at the moment. Um, there is a question regarding the star distance cell pose, uh, whether that 
training data sets are available somewhere. So I, I used uh, essentially what uh, is provided by the developers. So for, for studies, they have, uh, I think, two or three uh, training examples. One was trained on uh, nuclear examples, uh, also from this broad uh, repository, like uh, 500, 600 different types of uh, uh, images of different types. And so this is available in their GitHub repository. Uh, and they have uh, also, I think, synthetic data. So essentially, I use, th I use that. And this, if you have fluorescent nuclei, you can try to use it and see how, how it performs. Um, if you have completely different data, you will have to retrain it. And so they have some instructions on their, on their website uh, on how to do that. Maybe I can just uh, try to get out of this. Um, and uh, if we go to here. I think on the repository, they have examples like 2D and 3D. Uh, in 3D, I don't think they have the data. Okay, this is how you do the notebooks. Um, so they have already exa also example notebooks. Probably you will find quite a lot of examples uh, and uh, a lot of more information on their actual talk. So here, yes. So this is a demo. This is basically a model. So in here you have the weights, for example, and there are other parameters you can set in Stardist. So all this is loaded um, in the um, when you load the Stardist. And what I did in the for for the, for the material available on the in Binder on Collab, I'm cloning this repository and then using those uh, those data to to run the segmentation. For cell pose, uh, cell pose is really designed to be usable out of the box. So basically when you run it, it downloads automatically uh, weights uh, because they train really on, on a massive amount of data. Um, and so you can retrain it specifically on your data. But I think their point is really that you, you would have one solution uh, to, fit, uh, to fit all kinds of, uh, of images. And fr from the feedback, it really seems to be the case. So it, it really, manages to segment an amazing uh, amount, uh, uh, variety of, of data. But again, every time you use those solutions and don't retrain, really you should do a benchmark and segment things manually, uh, for example, and recheck how good your segmentation is. Yeah, well, the question I think was rather also about the availability of the training data. So the training data for cell pose, I mean, if you, if you go on the, read the bioarchive um, paper, they tell you exactly where the data are coming from. I think most of them are, that there was a competition actually, um, I don't remember how it was called now, uh, where people competed proposing uh, deep learning approaches for segmentation of nuclei. This was also led by the cell profiler uh, people. Um, so they used uh, this, I think, and added other sources of data. And so everything is public. So if you read the paper, you will find all the sources of, uh, of, the, of those data. I think maybe they mentioned this uh, here, if it was used in the... Um, it was called something bowl, and now I forgot exactly what the name was. Um, but I, I, I can post this also on the, on the um, uh, repository, on the, on the image SC in case people are interested. It will come back. Yeah. But everything is public, yeah. Okay. Um, general question, what do I have to consider when installing Jupyter and having to access computational resources on a remote server to which I can connect with SSH? To, so, can you just start with the question with what? Uh, so like what should be considered when using Jupyter and installing Jupyter to use it with a remote server over SSH? Um, there is nothing really fancy to be aware of. So the only thing that might be a problem is uh, access to your server via, via Jupyter. Um, um, so some, some IT departments don't really like people to access uh, to Jupyter, uh, to, to their, to their uh, infrastructure via Jupyter. 
uh, and so they, they there are firewalls that uh, make it difficult. But uh, um, these are really specific questions that you should ask to your to your IT IT people. There are always workarounds. Um, so I will I will post uh, explanations on how you can uh, use SSH in any case to access a cluster, for example. Um, a, but it it really requires uh, uh, some effort. But I will post a solution um, on the on, on as an answer to your question. Okay. Uh, and can you use uh, MATLAB from Jupyter? Uh, not that I know. Uh, you can run, of course, you can run uh, MATLAB from a, a command line uh, bash cell uh, in, in your notebook. So you can run anything you can run from the command line, you can also run in the notebook, right? But this would not be equivalent to what I showed with, with R, for example, where you can push and pull things. Um, so I don't think there really is a really a solution for this. So there is an Octave uh, kernel that you can run in Jupyter, which is like the open source version of MATLAB. But uh, I don't think that there is a mat purely MATLAB solution. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Okay, very well. And since we already overrun, I think it's good to stop here. So thanks again for your attention and thanks again to the new bias organizers for uh, uh, giving me the chance to uh, giving this course.